I would like to describe a field in which little has been done, but in which an enormous amount can be done. This field is not quite the same as the others in that it will tell us little of fundamental physics, but it will tell us much about the strange phenomena that occur just below our perception. In contrast to the natural philosophers of the past, the scientists of this field delve into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. Their quest is to understand and create the imperceptible. After all, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Hello and welcome to the Materialism Podcast, an exploration of the past, present, and future of material science. I am Taylor Sparks. I'm an associate professor at the University of Utah, and I'm joined by Andrew Falkowski, my trusty co-host. Andrew, how are you doing? Good. Pretty tired. It's been a, <laughs> it's supposed to be a holiday weekend, but it's just turned into a grind. Dude, tell me about it. This winter, we, we did the COVID thing. We have had the flu thing. My poor wife is sick now. It's a heavy semester anyways. I'm just like barely getting by, it feels like. Yeah, you're teaching three classes this semester. Three. It's a heavy load. I'm getting ready to go on sabbatical, so announcement on that coming soon. Uh, and I think it's like I'm going to be so relieved when I finally get to not teach for a year and get to just do research and do other things that, yeah, I'm very ready for it. So well, we got a good episode today. Yeah. Uh, you know, Andrew and I both cut our teeth working in the materials field by working in ceramics. Uh, did a lot of ceramics research, actually making components, right? Casting them, sintering them, measuring their properties. Ceramics are, I would say, arguably, maybe, don't fight me, right? But <laughs> I would say they're the hardest class of materials to work with. Uh, they are so prone to fracture. They have so many bugaboos. It's all happening at crazy high temperatures. They're tough. Um but it, it's even tougher when you don't know what's going on inside that black box of a furnace. When you're trying to make these things and all you have is like the before and the after, that's really hard. And today's episode helps to shed some light on what's going on in that in-between region. Like, how do you actually measure thermal properties? How do you measure how these things expand or contract or get an idea of the stresses going on in there? You know, that's been a long-standing problem for ceramicists for a long time. And today we're going to interview uh, a company, Expert Lab Services, uh, Daniele Paganelli, the, the manager of this company, who has some unique solutions to this problem, which I know going back 20 years when I was an intern at Ceramic Tech, I would have killed to have access to this information for all the projects I was working on. Yeah, I mean, ceramics are like one of the last materials you should ever work with. <laughs> like you only choose to do a ceramic when there's no other option. And um, yeah, trying to optimize those processing conditions because everything's always a little bit different. And as our guest that we're going to be interviewing points out, a lot of times these changes are often external factors. Maybe oh, yeah. energy costs are too high, right? You, you can achieve the best properties, but it costs too much energy. Maybe there's limitations on the resources that you can actually get. Yeah. Purity is everything when and it comes to all the ceramics. Time. Yeah, like what if you can't get the best powders? What if you can't get that um, Toso zirconia yeah, powder? Right? And you have to settle <laughs> for something else. Um, it's... It's a big deal. And how do we actually look, you know, inside the furnace in order to get a better idea of how our materials are actually performing at these temperatures and when we need to take them out and how fast we need to center them? I think our guest outlines some great tools for allowing us to look in that box. Yeah, absolutely. So without further ado, we'd like to introduce our guest, Daniele Paganelli. Daniele, tell us about yourself. Yeah, sure. So I graduated in chemistry in 2006. Then I took my master degree in 2008 uh, um, on chemistry for the sustainable uh, development. But actually, the topic of my of my thesis was about photochemistry and, and, and quantum chemistry. So it was nothing related to sustainability, which is today is very very uh, important. But Anyway, uh, at the end of the university, uh, the professor asked me to join uh, in a PhD program in uh, uh, Ohio. And, uh, and at the same time, my father asked me to join his company uh, to bring on the, the development of uh, a measurement instrument for the ceramic industry. So I decided to, to, to go with my father and start uh, working for uh, the company that at the time was the name was Expert System Solutions. Um, so I always loved writing software. So the first topic which I addressed was uh, image analysis for uh, uh, measuring the material properties through uh, the camera. And then I did a lot of other things and now I'm here. So that's more or less 
the, the, the How, story. Was that tough short. to uh, say no to grad school and come back home, or was it exciting? Were you ready to be done? Were you done with quantum dots, right? Was it exciting to come home, or was it a little bit tough? <laughs> no, well, uh, it was... Well, actually, at, at the first... At first, working on... Uh, on uh, uh, such a material topic, <laughs> how can I say, <laughs> like ceramics, uh, was a little bit of a uh, scientific, scientific delusion at the beginning, because ah, I mean, I was doing photochemistry and, and all this stuff, it seems super interesting. But actually, I found it very interesting also um, uh, exploring the ceramic uh, world, because uh, as your uh, as your intro says, there is a lot which oh, could yeah. be done. And, and in, this, in the surrounding manufacturing, that's that's really true. There is really still a lot which can be done because it changes continuously. And the environment changes, the legislation changes, the, the uh, energy requirement change. So actually, it is a field which is full of, uh, of challenges. So uh, actually, I, I, I'm, I'm satisfied of that choice. And uh, at the beginning, I had to uh, write a lot of software, which I really enjoyed. Uh, so I was happy even. Oh, good to hear <laughs> it. Back. it. It was, it was a good, good choice. It. Maybe not sexy, <laughs> as, as I say, but it was a good choice. Well, I mean, quantum <laughs> dots are certainly sexy, but... They're not being used very much, right? But ceramics, every single one of us will use it. We come in contact with a ceramic, you know, all the time. It's all around us. So very, very real world applicable. Well, tell us a little bit about Expert Lab Service, your company. What is it? What do they offer? Just in well, a nutshell, uh, what does the company do? So uh, we say we are a boutique of uh, ceramic industry industrial solutions. So uh, we, we did uh, consulting for many years and uh, the founder actually, uh, Mariano Paganelli, who is my father, started as a consultant and actually started the company to solve problems. <laughs> so um, th that was our main uh, uh, business. Uh, and in solving problems for our customers, we started developing uh, laboratory instruments to measure material properties. So we produce laboratory instruments and uh, uh, we produce also software to make calculations needed for uh, modeling the problems and solving, uh, solving them. Uh, so these are the three areas, uh -huh. consultancy and so training and et cetera. Uh, instrument, laboratory instruments, and okay. software. Well, tell me about the, the origins of the company. Why did your dad decide to do this? Well, so uh, the story is quite interesting because, uh, so he started in the late 80s after coming uh, out from a large ceramic manufacturer uh, who asked, asked him to, to fire a large portion of his laboratory Oof. crew. Because in that age, they were externalizing all the costs. They were saying, oh, that's laboratory cost too much. Let's, let's fire everybody. We don't need laboratory anymore. Uh, there are no more problems to solve. It's all settled. And everybody was doing like that. And it was not, uh, I mean, he felt not good about this. So he went away. And um, so he started his own company focusing on software. So software was the first product of the, of, uh, the, the company. Um, software for optimizing the, the, the composition of uh, the ceramic products, the, the body and the glaze, etc. Uh, then in his work of consultancy, he found that the instruments that were used in, inside the laboratory at the time were completely inadequate in, in giving uh, giving answers to the problems of the ceramic instrument in industry. And so he started designing his own uh, instruments, very specific for the ceramic. So he didn't want to uh, design the general instrument for solving any pro for measuring any material property. He what, just wanted to see what happens to the ceramics inside of the production so tell cycle. Us, 
So very, very a little more about that. Like when you say that there's these unsolved problems, uh, I think Andrew and I certainly know the things you're talking about, but for the people that haven't, you know, spent hours and hours baking and making and measuring and, you know, working with ceramics, what sort of issues are there that are challenging for in the ceramics industry? So in the, in the, especially in the tile manufacturing, uh, we have uh, several problems. So the first one is that uh, the energy oh, yeah. cost and the energy consumption of the process. So in order to reduce that, you need to increase uh, to, to uh, make the, the tile uh, thinner. So you use less material, you need less heat. Uh, you need to uh, increase the speed of the process. So you have less dispersion sure. because that you take less time. So inherently. Uh, and, and this is one problem. Then you have the flexibility of the production. So ceramic is now uh, a field where, I mean, it is like, uh, I don't know, uh, clothing. I mean, uh, the, the appearance is everything. So uh, you cannot produce a large quantity of the same product. You need to produce small batches, so small that you, you don't have time to, to, to clear the, the furnace from the first product that you, you already need to, to add the second pro the product in line gotcha. to be produced. Yeah. So, uh, so they are solving this with digital printing of, of the, 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 the design and uh, by producing very large slabs of ceramics, then, then they cut to whatever shape they need. And, uh, and this is another problem. Then there is a, a severe problem of uh, raw materials, which uh, now it is crazy. They, they, they take raw materials for, for, from all over the world. And this is very costly, of course, very impacting on the environment. So uh, if we, we could help the ceramists use local raw materials and solve the problems that all these local, not perfect raw materials cause to the production cycle. So now we have a technology that it is very standardized. Everybody has the same machine working in the same way. The effect is that you need to standardize also the raw materials. So everybody's buying the same wherever in the world. So if we could make the process more intelligent, more flexible on the raw material, we could save a lot of energy and pollution in, uh, in uh, transportation. So, so summarizing are, it was, uh, tiles are getting thinner, right? That's a way to be more efficient. We need to do them faster to prevent losses, essentially. And then the last one was understanding the raw materials as they come in and working towards small batches. Like, yeah, those are major challenges. Um, I just think, you know, when I was yeah. working at Ceramitech, we would develop one product. We worked with like one chemistry system with just slight changes to it. And even a slight yeah. change, the stuff would sinter differently. It would cast differently. You know, a 5% a solids loading change is like totally two different materials, like completely different. Um, so I, I totally get the challenges that, that you would face. And how are these companies supposed to be nimble and quick and figure out the best processing routes if they don't even have the tools to assess it for any one of those those parameters let alone all of them yeah i think often in academia we're really focused on getting the best possible properties but processing conditions and the cost of getting those properties are often <laughs> just ignore them you know, rarely considered <laughs> at the same time when you're trying to then optimize something you often come across as your father and you have seen um, the issues with the tools, right? Like you can't actually optimize something to make it better or improve its results if your tools don't actually give you the necessary information. So I think the approach there is really yeah. good and, and also like what we're discovering in a number of fields right now where our tools are inadequate to actually help us improve our properties. Yeah, the, the, we have three design principles in, in the measurement instruments, which are uh, that the kinetics is more important. So the dynamics is more important than the equilibrium. So uh, measurement instruments usually try to take yep. away all possible interference and all possible dynamics to measure the theoretical property at equilibrium, which is of no practical use in the industrial field when you need to go fast. So that's, that's a very important part. The second is that the material is more important than the standard. 
ceramists try to apply international standards on glass, on uh, fly ashes, on things like that, because there is no there was no standard for ceramics. They took those standards from other in industries and tried to apply those standards to the, to the ceramics, which is a completely different material. And, and so... Uh, <laughs> up to a few years ago, they, they were using completely uh, unuseful methods to assess things that makes no sense because then it behaves differently. And the third one uh, is that, um, well, that's very specific to how we work. Uh, seeing a process is more important than, is, is better than touching it most yeah. of the times. So uh, all our instruments are optical because this in our field is what best guarantee that you are not interfering with the process while you are measuring it. So uh, there are um, uh, several instruments, for example, mechanical dilato dilatometers, which measure the thermal expansion. <laughs> they completely fail with ceramics because once uh, something interesting starts happening in your material, the, the, the measurement instrument will deform it and, and uh, completely uh, make the measurement unuseful. So, um, so that's our three philosophical points. So kinetics, standard, uh, yeah. Well, I think very well said. Um, let's talk a little bit about the instruments that your company offers because they're cool. It, it's the three you said, and they're all optical. You've got a dilatometer for measuring thermal expansion. You have a pyrometer, well, not a pyrometer, but you have an optical microscope, yeah. right? So you can we'll see what's happening. Uh, and it, and I, oh, I assume it's yeah. also capturing temperature. And then your last one is a, a fleximeter, right? Uh, anybody, again, who's worked with ceramics knows these things warp and trying to understand and prevent and model that warping is only going to be as good as the measurements you can make. So tell us a little bit more about what are the advances because, you know, there's types of these tools out there is the big difference that you're doing it totally optically or what, what other innovations are there here? So uh, actually let's start with a heating microscope. In a heating microscope, you have uh, a, a tiny sample, like a cylinder of uh, two, two millimeter of base and three millimeters of height inside the furnace. And you look at the uh, shape of your sample with a camera and you have backlight illumination on your sample. So you look at the image of the shadow of your sample. And um, what you see, you see that how it shrinks, not very well, because the resolution is not high enough. But you, you can see the sintering, more or less. But most of all, you see the softening of the material and the melting of the material. So it is important to identify the sintering, the melting, and for glassy material, the spherical shape. So the shape at which the surface tension is so strong that keeps the material apart. Can you from get contact the angle as well from this? Is it, is it right along the side to the point where you can get contact angle? Yeah, exactly. You can you can also measure the contact angle. Um, so up to the nineties, there was uh, a camera taking photos every some minutes or things like that. Uh, so he had the idea to put uh, an analog uh, gotcha. video recorder connected with a computer, which was doing the image analysis on the image and measuring all the parameters uh, in order to. Uh, produce a plot or something electronic digital so that was the idea and and it was automatic so it automatically identified the shapes more or less and uh, um, it stopped when it needed to without going on forever etc um, and that was the innovation about the heating microscope uh, which more or less is the same. What we added in the last years was uh, more image analysis uh, uh, power and uh, more sophisticated method to identify the shapes or better algorithm for calculating geometrical properties. That's all. Uh, for the uh, optical dilatometer uh, or dilatometer. Yeah, well, we say dilatometer. <laughs> The dilatometer, okay. Uh, for the optical dilatometer, uh, the uh, core idea, which was also patent, patented in uh, 2004, was to uh, motorize the camera. 
So in optical dilatometer, you have two cameras looking at two tiny, tiny edges of the sample. And, and you measure the displacement between these two tiny points of your sample. Uh, in classical double beam optical dilatometer, which exists since, yeah, forever. I, I don't know, many decades, yeah, uh, all everything is fixed. So you have the two cameras looking at the two points, the material expands or shrinks, and when the material exits from the field of view of the camera, you're done. The, the measurement is finished. Um, of course, this is not, not good for something that centers 10% because it's, it always goes out of the, of the field of view. So the idea was to motorize the camera, first one and then both motorized. Uh, with motorized camera and the software controlling them, as the sample is going to exit from the field of view, the uh, analysis is frozen from for a few milliseconds. The camera moves, brings back the image in the center of, of, of the camera, and then the analysis is resumed and it goes on from that point till potentially zero. You can follow everything. Um, so that was the core uh, innovation in that in that instrument. Uh, which, which, of course, is very useful for ceramics, for soft material, for incoherent material. We measure sand. I mean, you can <laughs> press together some sand and well, measure Working it. with uh, ceramics, whenever we're processing something in the furnace or we're even trying to get dilatometer measurements, there's kind of a lot of these black box elements that we just simply can't access. We kind of know our input parameters. We know the parameters of maybe the furnace. But really, it's kind of a lot of like post hoc reasoning to try to figure out whether or not it worked the way it did, or if something went wrong, why it actually happened. So the ability to measure in real time and actually see exactly what's happening at each stage of the experiment without any of the interruptions of the mechanical test is really fascinating and incredibly useful. I think for academics, uh, you know, it's one thing to be an industry where you make big old samples, but academics, we make tiny little samples, right? Little baby things. And yet the dilatometer, I know the one we have, it takes, uh, I think, 40 millimeters is the minimum size. So if you don't have a big, long matchstick shaped sample, which often that's a way bigger sample than most of us are ever making, then you have to put another material in and you know it's thermal expansion, you have to subtract it away. It's this whole rigmarole. Um, so I could definitely see the value in just being able to look at something and observe it directly. How do you put markings on it? Are these just features that are on the as prepared surface or do you have to mark it with a speckle pattern and something? How does this work? You need to give a, a certain shape to the sample, but you don't need to put markings on. Uh, it works. Um, so basically what you need to provide is a clear focusing plane. So the sample are like tra trapezoids, okay? So where you have a sharp edge and you look at that sharp edge because otherwise the focus gotcha. is not good. Okay. So that's two tools. You've described the optical heating microscope, the optical dilatometer, and last not least, the fleximeter. So the last one, yeah, the last one is the optical fleximeter or fleximeter. Uh, so the, also this technique actually is quite old, but it was unusable <laughs> in, the, in its original form. So the original name of the technique was the Steger tensiometer. In that technique, uh, you put a large uh, bar of ceramics inside the furnace. You, you connect uh, a pen on uh, the other side. So the, 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 the bar passes through the furnace and uh, on one side of the bar, you have a pen drawing on paper. Okay. So as the sample deforms <laughs> down, the pen That's goes so down. That's so rudimentary. As the pen deforms up. Okay. okay. <laughs> That's what, how it works. And uh, so, but that, the pen was also, I mean, no, no problem. The problem was that uh, the whole thing was quite massive sure. and it was slow. So, and it was difficult to set up. It was laborious, so unusable. Like nobody was using it. Everybody knew it existed, but nobody was using it. Um, so the idea was to use the same technique we use for the dilatometer to measure the, 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 the flexion of uh, a bar of ceramics suspended between, between two sustain and, and look at it, the forms uh, as the temperature rise. And one important point is that the temperature must rise very quickly because that's the industrial condition. So up to 80 degrees per minute. 
And, uh, and this was a, a, an incredible, I mean, we still find interesting things in, in that technique after so many years. It started in the beginning of 2000, also this technique. I mean, by looking at uh, a raw, uh, unfired sample, of course, you follow the pyroplasticity right. of the material. So the material starts, the viscosity lowers, and the material starts like flowing uh, over its own weight, and so it goes down. And it goes down at different speeds depending on uh, the composition. So depending on how many um, uh, glassy phases it develops inside, and etc. It's very complex. And, but if you put a fired material with the glaze uh, uh, layer upon, so very similar to a finished product, actually, if you take a tile out of the furnace and you cut it and you put it on the instrument, you discover really interesting things. For example, you can discover the tension state between the glaze and the body. You, don't, you have an indirect measurement, of course. You cannot, there is no way to, to see the tension state of a material, as we all know. Uh, so, but you have a method to discover what it is. So the method is to uh, heat it up again, and by heating it up, it will deform up or down because of the different thermal expansion of the two layers. Okay, and that's clear. As you reach the coupling temperature between the glaze and the material, it is the temperature at which the glaze attaches or detaches from the substrate. So it doesn't matter what the, the, the thermal expansion of the two materials is, there is no more tension between the two because the, 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 there is, it is too soft to exert any, any tension. So, if now you take the optical dilatometer curves and you overlap them at that temperature, so instead, usually two thermal expansion curves are overlapped at the room sure. temperature. They are, yeah, because you start at zero. Okay, you take these two curves and you overlap them at that temperature, the temperature at which the two layers attach one to the other, then at room temperature, you will see they are no more overlapped most of the times. And this means that one of the two layers cooling down becomes longer or shorter than the other. And this means it is in traction or in tension. Practically speaking, how would a company use this tool? Would they measure that and then they would try and find one with the that minimizes the residual strain? Would they use this to figure out the temperature of processing saying, you know, this this looks like it's softening and it's at this sort of point where it's going to be a, applied to the ceramic at a lower temperature and so it's going to be lower energy. How would they use this? They use it in many ways. The first one is ensuring that your product that you are developing in your laboratory will not destroy the industrial <laughs> furnace when, when it enters oh, inside it, okay? Because it is, if it is too plastic, it will roll around the, 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 the tube, the, the rolling tubes inside of the furnace and, uh, and somebody will come to yep. shoot you, okay? So <laughs> it is a self-preserving procedure for the laboratory to ensure that the pyroplasticity of the raw material of the unfired tile is not too high. That's the first. The second is that it must be stable. If the, uh, you develop your, your procedure, your thermal cycle, your thermal treatment, and then you must verify that if the furnace, because it is not so exact, the, an industrial furnace, is 20 degrees above or 20 degrees below, it, it will not destroy the furnace, okay? It still goes, okay? Um, then you can study the compatibility between your uh, substrate and the glaze before going into production. So if you have a glaze and a body that couple together, put the glaze into tension, of course, as we all know, probably, glass is not resistant to tension. 
So uh, what we will have is a very fragile surface, uh, a surface which will crack with time probably. So that's one way they use this tool. And the other way is to uh, similarly avoid that the glaze is in too much compression because if it is too compressed, when you cut the tile, it explodes and it starts cracking in unpredictable ways because there is too much energy inside. Uh, so those are, and, and the, the last one is always with, te- with tension, related to tension, is uh, predicting if the tile will be flat or Have not. Have you applied this technique to any ceramic materials or processes outside of the glazed tile industry? So in all these years, we, uh, I remember I talked to customers outside of our field, for example, in glass enamels for uh, for metals or refractories, they use it in refractories, they use it in uh, power uh, generation plants, the, especially the, the heating microscope, uh, because the, they need to determine the melting point of the, the hashes in order to avoid destroying the burner. We, we sold one to a university which was doing research on uh, fuel cells, fuel cells. Uh, because they were studying th- those composites, ceramic composite, with many layers, one above the other. And so they needed to have uh, thermal stability and uh, absence of stresses between the, the layers. And they used that, that gotcha. instrument. Gotcha. I mean, I can see a lot of uses for this. Matching thermal expansion coefficients is one of the hardest things in the ceramic processing industry. It's always going to be a problem. And most of the time, you can't really get a good read uh, until you do a number of experiments that are potentially damaging to your furnace, as you mentioned. So I can see a lot of use for this in ceramics. Anything else you want to tell us, Daniela? So you sell these products. You want to talk about your consultancy? What would you like our listeners to know about the other services your company offers? <laughs> well, uh, we, uh, so we are a counter laboratory, mostly uh, for nearby uh, customers, even though we do consultancy. So we, we can run this entire process of uh, from the raw materials. So we take, we are customer all over the world that send us pallets full of raw materials they have in that area and ask us what can we use uh, to in order to produce a good product. And we do this many times, a lot, um, all, all over the, really all over the world. Uh, frequently we collaborate con, uh, with uh, producers of uh, machines. So they, they sell the plant and the solution. So how to produce uh, in that area with the local raw materials. And so we, we take the raw materials, we take the available glazes, and we, run, we, we do the entire analysis and we say, okay, take these in this proportion, fire at that, with that thermal cycle, and you're good to go. And that's the main thing we, go, we do for consultancy. We are going back to the origin, <laughs> if I can say. So we are resuming the development of a web-based service, which will be called Ceramics Genome, uh, which is basically a database of raw materials, glazes, uh, semi-finished products, and uh, with all the uh, properties of the materials and with the models that you can run in order to optimize the cost, to optimize the formulation, to optimize several properties of your uh, final uh, composition of, of whatever you are developing in the ceramic field, and it can even connect with our instruments to take out the measurement and run this compatibility test. So will be actually it will be available in a few months. But we are we are in a, in a good shape, and we plan to also give to this product uh, a functionality like uh, a marketplace focused exclusively on the ceramic industry with the possibility to take from the marketplace the properties and the available products and try to match with what you have in-house, what you're using or what you are producing yourself. So the idea is to offer this this kind of marketplace. So will feature. it be a subscription model? Will pay, people pay to have access to this data or what are you envisioning? We are putting a lot of effort in uh, giving a, a strong service to the customer. Yeah. So. Uh, we are developing uh, complex models and the calculation uh, procedures which are of use for the, for the customer. So uh, 
uh, it, we, we still don't well, know. I think it makes sense because here you have a company that is a characterization company. You build tools for characterization. You do a lot of case studies. Uh, you know this field really well. You're receiving samples from all around the world. Like it makes a lot of sense that you would have a good bird's eye view of the field to put together this sort of uh, not just a visualization, but a, a material matching tool for the ceramics industry. Uh, Andrew and I work a lot in materials informatics these days. So as you're describing it, my mind's sort of like worrying about like, oh wow, we could we could do cool <laughs> things there. So. I'm excited to see what comes of that. So, Daniel, if people want to get in touch with you, if they're curious about one of your products, whether that's one of your instruments or a measurement or anything else, how do they get a hold of you and where can they learn more? So, well, you just go to, the, to our website. There is a contact uh, section with the email address. So, the address. website is expertlabservice.it. Okay, well, it was a pleasure to chat with you. Uh, best of luck to you with your company. We think it offers a great service it's certainly stuff that i would have i would have found myself using and i would still use today actually so thank you okay, very much we'll talk to you later bye-bye bye-bye okay Today's episode was obviously sponsored by Expert Lab Service. You can check them out at expertlabservice.it for Italy, right? On their website, you can learn all about the same tools that we were talking about in today's episode. For example, the heating microscope, the optical dilatometer, the optical fleximeter. You can see all how these instruments work. You can request quotes for them. And then something that's cool that they offer is actually laboratory services. So if you're not quite sure if this tool would provide value, you can actually have them run some samples for you. You can do it on a contract basis, do it in individuals, and you can see whether or not this would add value to providing real-time feedback to your ceramic processing. I think you're going to really like it. Obviously, we only promote products on here that we really believe in. And another show of how valuable this is, is you can see what sort of companies are already partnered with them. A lot of the major ceramic manufacturers out there you'll find are already using their services. So check them out and see what they can do for you. That's expertlabservice.it. This podcast is also sponsored by Materials Today, an Elsevier community dedicated to the creation and sharing of material science knowledge and experience through their peer-reviewed journals, their academic conferences, and their educational webinars and more. In fact, this episode is going to come out in early to mid-April, which gives you plenty of time to hit the April 29th deadline to submit to an upcoming conference hosted by Elsevier. It's called the 7th International Conference on Multifunctional, Hybrid, and Nanomaterials. Get this, it's taking place in Genoa, Italy. It's going to be beautiful. If you haven't been before, take my word for it. It is phenomenal. It goes from the 19th to the 22nd of October of this year. So you need to get your abstract submitted in time if you plan on presenting. And then you'll be able to uh, register at a later point. So April 29th, if you want to go to this, you can just Google the 7th International Conference on Multifunctional Hybrid and Nanomaterials, or you can navigate to the elsevier.com slash events slash conferences, and you'll be able to find a link to it there. I think it's going to be fantastic. Like I said, I'm going to be there. We're going to be talking about the podcast there, probably recording a live episode so you can meet us, hear about our research. I think it's going to be really a cool place to be. I think the Elsevier and Materials today are doing some great things for the industry. As always, thank you for listening to this episode of the Materialism Podcast. If you have any questions or feedback, please send us emails at materialism.podcast at gmail.com. We are also on Instagram and Twitter, so if that's where you like to hang, you can uh, <laughs> send us a DM on that and uh, start chatting with us. We love to hear your ideas for new episodes. We like to hear your feedback, what we're doing well, what we could do better. Um, it really helps us if you subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, wherever you find your podcasts. And if you can leave a review, because that helps other people find our show, and it means a lot. Uh, finally, uh, we'd like to give a shout-out to Alphabot and Colabite, who make the music for the podcast. They both make a ton of really cool synthwave music, and you can go check them out on Spotify and YouTube. Catch you next time. See you later. The inventors of fire, electricity, magnetism, iron, lead, glass, silk, cotton. The makers of tools, the captors of lightning, the architect, the engineer, the musician, are all beneficiaries of the materials of this world and are bound only by their imaginations in manipulating those materials. <laughs>